being in nothingness and Jean Paul Sartre's existentialism is one of the most powerful ideas if you want to live a free life of agency and self direction instead of a life of excuses and of defensive mechanisms. But how do we aspire towards the existential ideal of being? Well, let's talk about that and more in today's video. It's so easy to blame external circumstances for the things that you do and the things that you say and the things that you feel. So often we will say things like, well, I only yelled at you because I got so angry. Or perhaps you said, well, being angry is in my nature. I'm an ESTJ personality type and I have a lot of anger inside of me and that's just how I express myself, right? Or maybe you would say, well, I am an INFP and because of that I tend to hold my emotions to myself rather than share it with other people. Jean Paul Sartre would call most of these kinds of explanations as being in itself. So to be in itself. Things are the way they are because of they are the way that they are. A share is a share because it has four legs because it's a share. Often these kinds of explanations are lopsided and static. So when we use personality psychology, which can be a very powerful tool to understand yourself and other people, there is a risk that we fall prone to staticism or defeatism or to excuses like these because these definitions are in and by themselves static categories and so we can lose our sense of freedom and our choice in how we get to be, right? Because typically the ideal that Sartre would strive for is what he called being for itself. But why do we get stuck in being in itself? What is the general mentality of a person that is stuck in being in itself? Well. One sign that you're stuck in being in itself is that you feel like life is inherently meaningless. To you, things are just the way they are and there is no reason to do anything different. There is no choice in the matter of who you are. You feel you have no choice, you have no agency and things because of that feel meaningless. Another sign is that you have mind in a body syndrome, right? You feel like a passive observer that is observing yourself taking certain actions and living in a certain way and doing certain things and you feel like the observer of yourself doing and experiencing these things rather than as the actor who is doing these things, right? So you're stuck in observation mode. You're observing your actions, you're like it's a movie unfolding. You're spotting yourself, reacting, losing your temper or engaging in bad cycles or spirals because you don't feel like you are the person doing these actions. The person that's doing these things is somebody else. You're just the observer that is observing itself taking these actions. But you're not just a head in a body. You're not just somebody stuck in a flesh prison. You are the totality of your being and everything that you do and everything that you are and everything that you feel is a part of you. There are many reasons why we don't feel that way and I can get through that in future videos but for now just focus on that. You are everything that you feel, everything that you say, everything that you do is a part of you and what you do. Now often we are driven to seek meaning in external things. We look for a meaning in observable and external facts. We look for a meaning in the rocks, in the nature, in the money, in the, you know, the coins that we get. Uh, we look for meaning in an apartment, a house, furniture, in all those like physical, material things. And it's very easy to get trapped because we assume that the objective world around us is the meaningful world. That is where meaning exists. Not in here, but out there, right? And so because we're stuck and addicted to this objective reality, often that's one reason why we get stuck in this sense of meaninglessness or in a kind of uh, what you could call it deterministic objectivism. Things are only their external facts and the more we seek external facts and materialism, the more we tend to get stuck in this feeling of not living our lives, not being free individuals, not being free agents. I did it so I could make money, to feed my kids, to put food on the table, to buy a house. And 
we're working towards these kinds of external goals, but through this, we often lose our sense of agency and freedom. We feel like the things that we do are pointless, inherently meaningless. The work that we do has no meaning. The things that we do don't matter. We're obsessed with these objective goals, thinking, you know, if I can get there, then maybe I will have meaning. But right now, I don't have it. What I have right now is not enough. The things that I feel right now, they're not enough. So let's examine Jean Paul Sartre's ideas and his antidote and what we can do about it. First, by thinking back to our own lives. What I want you to think about is this. Can you think of something you did recently that you're not proud of? Something you said or did at work or to a friend or something you posted on a comment on a YouTube video that you don't feel proud of, something you said that you don't feel good about, right? And can you think about why you did those things? Think of if there was a reason. Were you upset that day? What was the trigger? Why did you say that? Where did it come from? Where did you learn to think that way or do these things? Was it something perhaps that your mom or dad would used to do that you just took on? Or was it because of your personality? Because you have a certain personality and it makes you sometimes do these things that you don't want to do, right? For example, maybe you're an ENFP and you find it hard to organize your life and you feel shame over the fact that your life is not very organized or structured. And then you say, well, I'm not organized because I'm an ENFP and ENFPs are not good at organizing things. Well, first, what I want you to recognize is when we use personality psychology, it gives us a sense of understanding, right? It gives us essentially comfort, a feeling of comfort. To hear somebody tell us who we are, well, you're an ENFP and ENFPs are disorganized. That's very reassuring. Oh, so that's why I'm disorganized. Oh, that's why I struggle to structure my life. Oh, that's why I have these problems. Because I'm an ENFP, not because of any choice that I made throughout my life. Not because of the work I did. It didn't matter. Actually, nothing I did really mattered. I tried to organize my life, but it never panned out because I'm an ENFP. And ENFPs are just not good at these things, right? Now, I want to challenge that feeling of understanding and comfort with the alternative. The alternative, right, is that you say that, no, while this might be what things are right, right now, maybe this is the facticity of the situation, maybe this is how things are in their current state and what they have been in the past, but right now, based on how I feel right now, what can I do about it if I act as if I had choice in the matter? What could I do differently to deal with that, right? Well. The first thing you're going to notice is, as soon as you start, start taking accountability for a situation, as soon as you say, well, I am responsible for how I organize my life and for what I do, and I have a choice in the matter, that brings something we can call existential angst. The feeling of being responsible for your actions, that your choices matter, that makes you inherently uncomfortable. And that's why we don't want to take responsibility for our actions, because we don't want to feel this state of discomfort. It's not nice to feel as if you have yourself to blame for your life and how you live and for what you do. And it's so easy to say, well, actually, I don't feel like I do have a choice because, you know, I was raised this way and school never supported me in doing anything different. And I don't have the resources around me to help me do anything different. And, you know, society is inherently unfair and, uh, you know, there's other things around me that make me this. It's so easy to switch back because, you know, while those things are horrible and awful, they do bring a sense of comfort. It feels comfortable, it feels reassuring to recognize that these external factors shaped my life and made me who I am and pushed me into a certain role and made me do a certain thing. The same goes really for personality. I found that personality and persona is something very intimately connected. Personality is often a mask we wield to the outer world in the sense that often we take on a role or a sense of uh, personality in order to deal with other people. Susan Cain, the author of Quiet, The Introvert's Revolution, essentially what she said is that in the past, we didn't really care about a person's personality so much as we do today. These days, we're all about personality. In the past, when we judged a person, it was based on their character, not their personality. So 
character being something much deeper and much more connected to your core sense of self and whether you are a moral person or an immoral person or a strong person or a weak person or a courageous person or a scared person, right? So the character of a person instead of their personality, their personality being how they appear, they're charming, they're social, they're friendly, you know, they're these and these things, right? These days we focus on the appearances of a person more so than their innate character or what they are on the inside. So there is a focus on this external reality, right? And Jean Paul Sartre, he would speak about being for others, right? So what he means with this is that there is an aspect of you that you can't control because ultimately I cannot control how you as an audience will understand me and my behavior. You know, I've been fighting for this for a long time, but people will keep posting online about me and they will keep saying, Eric is this and that and is uh, this and this and does this and that. And a lot of the time I have no choice over that matter. And there is an extent of inevitability of a lot of these things, right? Say a kid is brought into school and the teacher is told that this kid is a problem child and this kid is going to be very difficult and is probably going to have a lot of struggles in school. Well, no matter what this kid does, this teacher is going to treat them as a problem child and is going to understand their actions as a problem child. Oh, now he's raising his hand again and asking questions. Oh, that's a sign that he's very stupid. You know, while another kid raising their hands would be like, oh, that's so nice that he's interested in class and trying to understand the subject. And that's so intelligent of him, right? So there is an inevitability to a lot of these things where, you know, your gender, your ethnicity, your cultural background, your family, whether you're rich or poor, these things shape how other people see you and treat you and understand the things that you do. Even your body language and facial expressions and how you dress and conduct yourself, it will influence how other people understand you. And you have no control over this, right? You can't choose how other people will understand the things that you do. Just as, say, if a guy would go up to a girl and ask her out, you know, if he was handsome and if he was a person that was very successful, you know, there's a high chance that she would consider him in a positive manner. And she would say, that's cool that he took the initiative. And oh, yeah, of course I could be open to take his number and to go out with him, maybe. Maybe we could lead somewhere, who knows, right? But if an unattractive guy would go and do that same thing, of course, there's a chance that the girl would be like, what a creep. Oh, why did he go up to me? I don't want to talk to this guy. Is he crazy? Is he... You know, what, is there something wrong with him? You know, like, while it's uncomfortable to admit these kind of things, it is true that, yes, our superficial aspects and these like things, we can't control that. And yeah, you're going to have to deal with a lot of these things. Just like, for example, if uh, a girl was uh, unattractive, that would also make her struggle in relation to guys and would make her often feel invisible or like she didn't matter to other people, right? So a lot of the time, see, these superficial aspects become a matter of you know, things that we can't control. So we have no control over our external reality and what other people think. In truth, to us, we can never read another person's thoughts. We can never really know what another person truly really thinks about us. They, we know that they must be having some kind of experience or subjective experience or conscious experience of life and what's happening around them, but we can never know for sure what that experience is like. I think that knowledge should give a lot of empathy. It should make you understand and want to understand other people more. And it should make you more curious and it should make you more aware that, hey, this person is caring about something, feels something, has something inside of them that I don't know. And I should be very fascinated, very interested in getting to know what that experience is. And I should be very careful not to judge other people and their behavior. And I should be very mindful about the observations that I have about other people too, right? Knowing that other people's opinions about us can shape us and who we are and how we are to other people. We should be very careful about our judgment of other people and what we say about others. Knowing that by doing so, by bringing our experience of them to them, by pushing our projections on them, by saying to them, well... You're just a stupid white kid, you know, or whatever, you know, like by doing these kind of things, we're kind of putting them in a prison of our mind. So we are putting them in a specific role. We're making them into objects like a rock or a, a stone or a piece of grass or a chair. 
we create and turn them into people that have no agency, no control, no choice in who they are. They are simply this because they are that. Because you're a man, you're like this. Because you're a woman, you're like that. It's so easy to take these kinds of ideas and put them on a person, right? To make them feel more predictable and understandable. And once again, we're doing this to understand people. And the feeling of understanding or of being understood is a feeling of comfort. So what we're looking for really is stability, a stable, predictable worldview where people act in predictable ways, where we can understand their actions through a certain lens, where everything is a certain way in order to give ourselves a sense of comfort. In a state of comfort, the mind doesn't have to do anything. It does not have to interpret. It doesn't have to ask questions. It doesn't have to uh, try to understand something. It doesn't have to build any new neurons. It doesn't have to send out any new signals. It can simply engage in a predictable autopilot, sending the same signals over and over again, back and forth, once and once more, <laughs> until forever and the end of time, right? So this is what we're looking for when we're looking for comfort or understanding. We're looking to find ourselves in a predictable role where we can act in a predictable way and where everything will follow a certain script and where we don't have to think or reflect on anything because thinking and reflecting on things, thinking about new things, acting in new ways, developing new skills, learning to do new things, that gives a sense of anxiety or discomfort. So what is the antidote to dealing with this feeling of anxiety or discomfort with who we are, with what we do, with what our life is like? Because if we look at a person who takes this to extremes, right, what we might see is something like, you know, intense pressure. So I've always lived with a sense of agency, meaning that I've always taken responsibility for who I am and trying to better myself. I tell people, you only have to tell me a negative feedback once and I'll adjust it, right? I'll try to fix it. Whatever thing that people, problem people have, I'll try to deal with it. I'll try to learn it. I'll try to master it. Whatever skill I lack, I'll try to study it and get it over time so that I eventually, you know, one day might hit this utopian state where I'm perfect and I have everything and I can do anything, you know? Uh, so, but really there's a lot of existential angst there. When it came to climate anxiety, I felt personally responsible for the state of the future of the planet and the environment. When it came to war in the world, I felt responsible for bringing peace. And to me, all I was looking for was to write one article, to publish one book, to make one video, which would ultimately make everyone in the world get along and would solve all the problems. Like I was looking for this one video, this one article, this one thing I could do that would ultimately set a, a stream of actions in mind, create a new chain of cycle of actions and activities that would eventually change the world, right? And every single time I published an article and it didn't have that effect, that was a failure on my part. I should have written something better, I should have done something more. There's something wrong with me, something wrong with how I write, with how I do things. And I need to fix that. I need to figure out what that is and I need to fix it so that I can fix the world. So there's deep existential anxiety there, right? In freedom and in choice, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure, and a lot of doubt. Because you're doing something new, you're experimenting, trying out different things, coming up with new strategies. Your brain is constantly trying to reform itself to come up with a better way of thinking, formulating the world, understanding the world. So there's a lot of problems there, which a person that lived in being in itself would laugh at. A person who lived in being in itself right now listening to me would laugh and say, you know, Eric is a silly and stupid guy. He doesn't realize that he doesn't have any control over these things, that he has no choice in these matters, and that ultimately nothing really matters. But now we can flip it. We can flip the script and say there's something deeply troubling about that, right? Imagine that nothing in your life from this point on would ever change anymore. Everything would be the same. Uh, from now on, everything would stay exactly the way things are right now, right? I think a lot of people would feel very uncomfortable with that thought, realizing that, oh, I'm gonna have to live this hell over and over again for the rest of my life. I'm gonna have to endure what I am enduring right now. I'm gonna have to deal with the problems that I'm faced with right now for the rest of my life. Am I really gonna want to do that? Am I really want to spiral into becoming an alcoholic from drinking too much, knowing that, you know, I'm going to be 
doing this for the rest of my life? Am I really going to want to continue studying for the rest of my life, never getting a job, never getting like anywhere? Am I really going to stay like this? <laughs> you know, like, do we really want to be trapped where we are right now? I think there is a deeply uncomfortable and deeply anxious thought in recognizing, hey, do I want to live like that for the rest of my life? And this is why a lot of existentialists shape their approach as a rebellion. They say it's a rebellion against, you know, how things are. So existentialists choose to create meaning, choose to give themselves agency, choose to do things because it's a rebellion against objective fact and objective circumstance. They perceive themselves as trapped in this objective world with the body, with all these things, where everything is kind of set in stone and where there is a deterministic chain of events that is slowly unfolding and there is no control over that and what's happening and the material circumstances of power and dynamics and game theory and national conflicts. And you're just a person in this massive world, but I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live with that feeling. I want to rebel against that. I am going to choose to try to change all these things, even if it's not possible. Now, I would say that there's something very admirable and very romantic about this kind of rebellion, but I would also question that fact. What I've recognized is that nobody should assume the role of God, recognizing that you cannot control everything. You can't change the world. You can't alone fix every problem around you. You can't alone deal with every issue that's happening in the world. I can't make every single one of you feel better today by just this video, even if I would like to. And even if I care and feel compassion for other people, I have to recognize these boundaries, recognize that I'm not God, that I'm just one person, and I have to focus on being for myself. So. With being for myself, what I would say here is first, recognizing that while my choices might not change the future of the world, they will change the future of those around me, those near me, the closest people in my life. They might have a chance of changing things around me in some way. So I might not be able to change the society, but I might be able to change the village I live in, or I might be able to change my environment where I live and how things are around me, right? So thank you everyone who tuned in. This was a video provided in full for my patrons, and what you're seeing today is an excerpt of the most core thoughts of being in nothingness by Jean Paul Sartre and how you can find a way to live with a sense of agency despite perhaps the defensive mechanisms that you might feel to excuse yourself because you're a certain person, you have a certain personality type, a certain gender, a certain nationality, and certain external circumstances that you can't control. How do you cope with those things, but how do you still find a sense of freedom, a sense of choice, and a sense of agency in everything that you do? You can watch the full thing on Patreon, just click the link down below.